Miracy. We lost our apartment. So me, my dad, and my sister moved in with my grandmother. And my mom had to stay with one of her friends because my grandma, my dad's mom, didn't like my mother because she was on drugs. So she was like, you know, that's not going to be in my house. I'm Esco Wilson, and this is the Self-Awakened Lifestyle. I'm a lifestyle designer and performance coach, and I've helped hundreds of professionals learn how to tap into the power of their innate potential and thrive on a whole new level. I've seen lives change. I've seen my own life change, and I want to help more people. That's what this podcast is all about, bringing my own experience together with scientific principles and holistic practices to help listeners enhance their personal and professional performance. In each episode, I guide my guests through a difficult issue or challenge, and through the mind-body-spirit connection, we will expand what's possible. In previous episodes, I've shared one of the absolute worst decisions I ever made in my life. If I were to have a shame-based narrative, it would start with this specific behavior where I said yes to a drug transaction with a woman who was obviously pregnant. And I said yes multiple times. And the baby is born and is obviously, in my opinion, some issues, child development issues. That child who I watch grow up right now is the same age as my guest today. And whether I acknowledge it or not, I strongly believe that something inside of me is trying to say sorry, is trying to apologize, trying to play the game of if I could do it all over again, knowing everything that I know now, this is what I would do right now to that child. I would create this amazing container of safety. I would nurture that child. I would allow that child to see itself being cared for. That way it can learn how to care for itself. So I'm trying my best, knowing that I can never make up for those behaviors. But in a lot of ways, this is me doing the best, trying my best that I can possibly imagine to do in this very complex situation. My guest today is Danica. I've been working with her for close to six months now. She's done some private work with me. We've done small group. And in the magic container of our small group program, she was able to experience the wonderful power of storytelling. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling? Hey, hey. (laughs) I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but I'm pretty good. (laughs) We have a lot to cover. Okay. Let's start out comfortable, light, easy, calm. What's your best way to get calm? I would say, honestly, to just ease into it, like flow into it, like just jumping straight into like getting asked questions can make me like a little nervous as you can see me stumbling over my words right now. But yeah, I would say just like starting off easy, like easy conversation, just get it flowing. That's what gets me like comfortable and in my zone. Make sure you're comfortable. We'll inhale together. Ready? So exhale all the breath out. And then we'll inhale together. And then exhale. Now continue to breathe. And I want you to experience like a certain level of heat at the bottom of your breath. Now shift energy from the bottom, like it's heavy and hot, and pull that into the back of your brain. Explore. Now start to elevate a sense of lightness. Focus on the top of the inhalation. And you want to pull energy up to a small dot, 18 inches above your head. Pull the energy up. When you're ready, tell me a story. What have you been through? I mean, it all started probably from what I went through as a kid, growing up with a mom who was at first an alcoholic and then turned to harder drugs and ended up being addicted to heroin, and a father who was also an alcoholic. So I grew up in a toxic household, I guess, of like, you know, surrounded by addiction. Hmm. Tell me, was it always that way? Or was there a moment where things were nice and then things shifted? 
Yeah, no, things were pretty, what most people would consider like normal. Like we both, my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad had his own like towing company and we were all the way up until I would say about fourth grade was when things were good. And something changes. You start to notice, what are you seeing? What are you watching? From what I remember, the first thing that I would like notice, my dad, he had stopped really working. Like he was doing more like freelance work. I would see him drink like a 12 pack of beer a day. And then my mom, she just wouldn't be there sometimes. Like, and if she was at home, she would lock herself in her room for like hours out the day. Um, And we like would knock on the door to like ask her to like come out, make us something, do something. And then she would just be like, give me a little bit. I'll be out in an hour and then never came out. So when she was there, she wasn't really even there. So that's when I first started to like notice little things. And then when we in school, you know, we learned a lot about in like health. I remember learning a lot about drugs and stuff. They just told us certain things like what it looks like when people are using like, all different kinds of drugs. So we learned like what, you know, heroin does to like, you know, the open sores that it leaves on your skin. So I started seeing little signs of like those sores on my mom. And I would see like around the house, like when I would do the dishes, spoons that are like black on the bottom. And there was a time that I actually found a baggie of the drug in her makeup bag when I was just playing in her makeup as a 14 year old girl, you know. So I take it and I go to my dad and he was like, where'd you find that? And I was like, in mom's makeup. And then he was like, give it to me. He was frustrated about it, but he didn't say anything further to me about what it was. Yeah, I'm so fascinated by that. I'm curious because, you know, one of my biggest pains is contributing to these type of outcomes where the mother is absent and not able to help nurture and develop her children in a way that's, you know, beautiful and long and sustainable. So I'm curious, like, so your mother, before drugs, like, characterized her as a person? I mean, even on them, she still held a lot of her same, like, character. Like, she was a very sweet, caring woman. Like, she would still cook for us for, like, dinner and stuff like that. And there were a lot of kids in our neighborhood. So our house was one that we, like, kids always hung out at. Also, because our parents were kind of strict. Well, my dad was kind of strict and didn't want to let me go to other kids' houses a lot. So our house became the hangout spot. So my mom would cook for, like, me and all my friends, too. And my friends always loved her cooking. They were like, I'm coming over. When's mom cooking? You know, so she was like that. She was very nurturing. She loves to give, like, little gifts and stuff. And I know those are things that I get from her. So, like. For example, Easter, you know, most people would just go buy an Easter basket pre-made from the store. Like my mom's the type that'll be like, oh, I I put it together and I got this because you use this. And I got this lotion because I know you like this scent. And she's still like that to this day. Like I'll go home and visit her and she'll always have like, I don't know whether it be like a new face lotion or an electric razor or something little, you know, little and simple, but something that she thinks that you would use. Wow, I love that. What's your relationship with your parents now? Um, it's good. I mean, I don't, I don't talk to them a lot. I go back and visit maybe like once a year, but I live on the opposite side of the country. But when I do talk to them, it's just normal conversation. Like, Hey, how are you? Have you been, I don't have any resentment towards them. So, you know, those were the biggest issues that I dealt with in childhood. Then, so I got married when I was 17. So I graduated high school a year early with a year of college credit done. And So when I was 16, we lost our apartment. So me, my dad, and my sister moved in with my grandmother. And my mom had to stay with one of her friends because my grandma, my dad's mom, didn't like my mother because she was on drugs. So she was like, you know, that's not going to be in my house. We stayed with her and I had got a summer job. So I was the only person in the house working. And I would come home late sometimes because I was catering. So, you know, I would get home at 10, sometimes a little later. And my grandma was like, you know, nobody can come in the house after nine. And I wasn't going to quit my job. And my dad wouldn't let me stay the night anywhere. So she ended up kicking me out. And I stayed with the guy that I was dating at the time who was in the military. And he was older than me. I was 16 or 17. He was 22, 23. And he used to have to sneak me on base every night just so I had somewhere to stay. I had to take a bus, a ferry, an hour-long ferry ride at that, and another bus to school, which is when I was doing the program that you can take college classes while you're in high school, and then you can get college and high school credit for it at the same time. So I got a couple extra credits doing it, so that's what allowed me to graduate early. I was going to go live with my big sister in California, 
But I ended up getting married to that guy. And then he got deployed like a month later. So while he was on deployment, I did move to California with my big sister and stayed there for about a year. So my marriage, we grew apart. Even when we were together, we didn't get along the greatest. And I was working two jobs. I was going to school. I wasn't asking him for any support or any help. And I had a girlfriend who was, you know, like always on social media posting nice things. I was like, well, what do you do? Like, what what do you do for work? And then I remember her telling me, oh, I don't want to like put you on to that lifestyle. And I was like, why don't you just tell me, you know, like I've already been through so much, like just tell me. And then she told me that she was like a high-end escort, basically. And I was like, okay, well, I'm interested. Tell me a little more. After she kind of told me what she did, she taught me the ropes, like told me, you know, where you post the advertisements, how to, you know, either go get a burner phone or download text apps. And my first experience Surprisingly, it was the guy's first experience too. And it was cool. We went, you know, on a motorcycle ride down the beach and then went out to dinner. A few months later, my husband had got back from deployment and I moved to Virginia with him to try to, you know, work on things. And then we realized that, you know, we had grown so much apart and um, we just had like a mutual agreement to go our separate ways. And then I started dating someone else and I was in a relationship for like eight months, I think. And then after that, Um, When I left him is when I started escorting full-time. After I left my husband, I did get my own apartment with the new guy. And then when he and I broke up, I left that place. And I was like already going up to DC on the weekends to work, but I didn't have anywhere to stay up there. So I just kind of started staying in hotels. And I did that for like probably like a year, year and a half, or maybe two years, actually. I was like just living in hotels. For 24 months, you stayed in hotels? Mm hmm. Nice ones, though. It was hard for me to get a place because not having pay stubs and having like legit income. So when it came to trying to get an apartment by myself, I couldn't get a place. When I finally did, they made me pay three times my month's rent as a security deposit and first and last month's rent. So I had to pay like over 10 grand to move in. Wow. OK, so you're in D.C. So when I was like in the whole like, escorting world, there was this guy that I used to buy weed from. And he and I became friends. And then one day he messaged me and was like, oh, what area are you working in today? And I told him and I was like, why, what's up? And then he was like, oh, I just wanted to make sure I don't put my girls in the same area so it doesn't interfere with your money. And I was like, what do you mean? So we ended up talking and then he was saying he had this girl that he was like trying to manage. And this is the guy that I ended up dating for five years. I was kind of looking at it like, okay, how can he kind of help me? Because where I was at in my game then, I just started, things were like kind of slow. I didn't really know the ropes. So I was kind of like figuring it out on my own. We just started like hanging out more. I don't know if that whole story that he told me about the other girl was even true because I never like met another girl ever. But anyways, then he and I were like always together. He started staying with me a lot at the hotels. He was with me like every night. So it kind of developed into like a relationship from there. He was selling weed and coke or whatever. Eventually we got an apartment together. Eventually like our relationship started getting abusive physically and verbally. Obviously he knew what type of industry I was in, what I was doing, but eventually like he would start to get jealous to the point where like I would be scared to like even leave my phone out and around because he's going to go through it and find something. He went through old messages between me and my husband before I ever met him when me and my ex-husband were married and was like, well, you don't treat me like this. And I'm like, well, first of all, that was my husband. Second of all, you claim to be a pimp. You don't want to be treated like a husband. It was crazy. Let's check in for a second because you have a stream of consciousness and that helps you. That allows you to like allow yourself to tap into the anxiety and then just let it flow. But try to keep it like trapped and try to like reflect on it. That's not your style. Your style is, all right, I feel it. Let me just get it out. And it's the ability to hear your voice speaking and you're listening to other people's responses you're seeing how they like receive your message and then that allows you to see yourself deeper so where you at how you feel right now i feel good i feel okay all right cool very good next what you got let it flow (laughs) during that time i was also like dancing on and off i had a couple crazy experiences that just popped in my head during that time of my life the craziest one i've ever had was like i went to a date and I went to like a hotel and it was like three o'clock in the morning. So it was definitely the middle of the night. So I get off on the floor with him and then, you know, he tries to like wrap his arm around mine 
And then he's asking me questions, but it was uncomfortable questions. And I knew something was up. At that point, I tried to stop mid hallway. I stopped. And I was like, I'm not walking with you. I was trying to turn around and go back to the elevator. So he's like, grabbed me, pulls me and drags me down the hallway. And like my wig, I had a wig on, my wig flew off, my coat came off. So while he's like dragging me down the hall, I'm trying to bang on people's doors. And I'm like, you know, yelling help. <laughs> Nobody comes out. And once we're in the room, he like, you know, is locking the door. And then he was like saying, this is why you need protection. So shit like this doesn't happen to you. And um, then, yeah, proceeded to like rape me. And then eventually, after all that, the hotel staff comes up and knocks on the door and asks if everything's okay. And that's as I was like scurrying to get my clothes, I like ran out. I was like, he was like, yeah, everything's fine. And I just like left. So that was probably the craziest experience that I had with that. I'm so, 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 so sorry that you experienced that. It's okay. Like, it makes us who we are. The craziest thing about it is it wasn't like, as traumatic as I feel like it should have been. I think that part of going through so much stuff before that point was that I was just so numb and I just almost forgot about it. So maybe that's like a trauma response or my trauma response is usually to like just sweep things over and act like they weren't that big of a deal. I believe everything happens for a reason. And I think that the universe has divine timing for certain things. So I feel like these last two years have been the first time that I haven't been in, you know, like fight or flight mode. I've been in such like a relaxed place, a relaxed state. I haven't been in survival mode. And I think that's where I've learned where I've grown the most because I've had the time to sit back and reflect. What did this trauma I've been through shape me into, you know? So far, we've walked Danica through a process of embodied compassion. We gave her a chance to acknowledge In the beginning of the episode, I'm nervous. I have tension in my body, and it's hard for me to share at this point. By acknowledging that and allowing her to take ownership and make decisions that are best for her in that moment, embody compassion. She can look at herself as somebody who deserves to slow down. The environmental cues are telling her, you are okay. We are on your side. It's okay to slow down. What's a good way for you to stimulate your thoughts? For her, it might be chronological order or something that, you know, it steps up into her mind in the moment. Either way, she's a giving her chance to tell her story. She chose a chronological order, which is powerful because it starts at the beginning, a life that is stimulated by many, many trauma episodes. She even says, I'm living in systemic fight or flight, consistent fight or flight. And it's been that way for a long time. After fourth grade, constant constant fight or flight responses. So how do we allow her to tell that whole story inside of a container of compassion that she feels in her body? Start to reframe it inside this container. Start to see it as she saw a beautiful opportunity. My parents did the best they can do. Yes, abuse, drug abuse, and they did the best they can do and they taught me many lessons. Opportunity to share the compassion that she's feeling for herself with her parents establishing a beautiful psychic bond with her mother and her father. She's able to forgive her parents and recognize the lessons that they taught her and all the effort they put in to do the best that they can do, even though the circumstances were grueling. Now, how can she do that for herself? She shares her story openly in this container of compassion and a memory emerges, a very traumatic memory. And she's able to recognize in sharing this story of her being brutally attacked, that because she lived this lifestyle of systemic stress, she numbed her emotions out to the point where she would actually forget a traumatic episode. So this is her slowing down and reframing her experiences, providing a beginning, filling in the details in the middle, but filling them in with compassion, a container of compassion. So the story is a story of compassion for somebody who's doing the best that they can do. You talked about the last two years, feeling an opportunity to reflect. What does the next two years look like for you? What's possible? I see things falling into alignment now. So I just see even more alignment then. And when I say that, I mean like every little thing in my life just kind of coming together, if that makes sense. As far as the new like career choice that I'm taking, it was almost put into my lap, but it's something that stimulates the way that my brain works. It just 
you know, came to me. So I feel like I see a lot more things like that happening in life. Yep. Creating opportunities to solve problems that stimulate you. That's what I'm hearing. And when you integrate all that you've been through, all that you are, through storytelling and then documenting the story and then giving the story like four dimensions. So it's not just worded. It has a smell. It has a sound. It has a look. This more integrated story. And it shows up and allows you to solve problems one step at a time on the fly, building the plane while flying the plane. That's that hustler. That's that entrepreneur. And all of us as entrepreneurs, anybody listening to the podcast, even people who like have like a certain kind of profession, got to create on the fly, got to move on the fly. And that's guaranteed. You got to iterate, adjust. And I feel like you definitely have that power. Tell your story, give it life and share with people that are willing to share with you equally. So when you're looking at your traumatic moments or you're looking at your history and you get a beautiful opportunity to create a nice thread of thought that adds meaning to your past, doing that once is not really enough. You want to do it multiple times. Some of us are perfectly fine by telling the story 20 times, and that will help to change the trigger mechanisms that are associated with telling that story, sharing that history, thinking about your past. Instead of having triggered responses that are very explosive and overwhelming and not really understanding where they're coming from, you are able to see, oh, yeah, this is me telling the story for the 13th time. And yeah, that's the same trigger that keeps popping up. And yeah, it's not as powerful as it used to be. I can anticipate it. That's why I love lifestyle engineering. I love to embody the changes. I love to talk about the changes. I love to meditate on the changes. I love to create content around the changes, videos and audios and websites and programs, retreats. All of that is just telling the story of awakening over and over and over and over. So her as my student and as somebody who has a lot of primal energy, a lot of survival type experiences, a lot of powerful energy experiences. I would love to see how she takes that power in her nervous system and creates embodied experiences. I guess that talking about things is kind of like invigorating for me and empowering and it's part of my like healing process. I don't usually find things hard to get over. Usually I'll just be like, okay, like that was traumatic, but it doesn't really eat at me except for this one situation. So my partner made me get an abortion. Um, and I say made me because I didn't want to, um, but I didn't feel like I had the choice when it happened. So that's something that I still am not completely over, but now I'm able to talk about it so that it's helping with the healing process. I took pride in myself for, you know, the fact that I have never been pregnant. I've always been really careful about it because I said that I didn't want to bring a kid into this world without it being with the right person and the right circumstances and stuff like that. So the one time I did finally let my guard down because I felt like it was the right person, the right circumstances and stuff like that. And then he was kind of manipulative. Like there were other reasons why um, we couldn't keep it, I guess, because he was like on this medication that could cause birth defects, whatever. But what he has said to me was, well, we're already having issues, so it's just going to make us break up, and then I'm going to start dating someone else, and you're going to have to see me with someone else, and I'm just going to take care of you and the baby financially. Is that what you want? <laughs> I'm just like, wow. I don't know why this was so triggering for me, but I think partly because I felt like everything else that's happened to me that's been like traumatic is something that was out of my control. I guess maybe that's why I'm so much more upset about it because I felt like it wasn't out of my control. Wow. So what are you hearing yourself say in terms of control versus non-control? That I guess when things are thrown at me in life, like I don't care how traumatic it is or how bad it is. If, you know, I didn't cause it, then I have no choice but to get over it. But then when it's something that I actually did cause, then it's a little, I guess, harder for me. It's just like a lot more that I have to like work through as far as on this topic to figure out why it bothers me so much, like more than anything that I've ever really been through. I don't think anything has really like bothered me to my core as much as this. Yeah. 
How many times you had a chance to talk about this? Mm, not a lot. Telling my story makes me feel invigorated, but that part of it doesn't. I see blockages I have up about it. What made it harder was the fact that it happened twice. What do you mean twice? So we got pregnant, um, had to get an abortion. And then maybe like six months later, I got pregnant. So by that time, he knew how I felt about like the first situation and everything. So when I told him I expected him to be happy and things to be changed, and it wasn't. And for me, I felt like it was meant to happen. I was like, this is a sign that obviously the universe is trying to give us a child, you know? And we're like, keep blocking that blessing almost is kind of how I feel. What he told me later was that, like, you know, he dealt with trauma in his own way and that he didn't want to, like, appear weak in front of me, that he would go downstairs sometimes and cry about it. But, you know, he just didn't want to do it around me. And I'm like, that's fine. I wasn't saying that you have to sit in front of me and cry, but don't just act like nothing happened a few days after it happened. You know, just don't go about life like normal. Like, you could just, like, sometimes ask me, hey, are you okay? So I think one part of me is that I always, I've been through so much and he knows that. So I always come off as a really strong person. And I don't like to show when I'm really that down. So I felt like I started building up resentment. But it was all because of not communicating on both of our parts, though. Yeah. Almost like numbing the experience by not talking about it. But instead, for me, instead of numbing, it was making it worse. And we talked about that. Like, you don't like the whole ideas inside. It took me talking to other people about it before I was able to talk to him about it. So giving language to this very, very powerful situation and allowing it to loosen up and allowing it to flow and give yourself a, a, like a focal point of consciousness between you and your partner. Like, listen, if we don't talk about this, if we don't allow this to, you know, have a story, we don't allow it to grow and be understood in all of its ways. We're not addressing what was trauma, at least for you. That's what I'm hearing. And like I said, let it out. The first time you shared this heavy story, you didn't mention that it was twice. The next time you came back and you said, yeah, it actually happened twice. And then the pain that you felt was embodied, much heavier than the, much stronger than the first time. Part of the story makes me feel invigorated. Like talking about all these other things are invigorating to me. They make me feel great. That's why I knew that this topic would probably have to be brought up last because everything else that I've said builds up the courage for me. It makes me, like I told you, telling my story makes me feel invigorated, but that part of it doesn't. <laughs> so it's like eventually getting it to be a part of that. So it be a part of one of my experiences. Yeah, that's the goal. So we understand step one is what you've been doing the last month. You went through a whole process where the person who feel comfortable communicating showed up and said, hey, here's the big secret. That is the hardest to get over. That's how you're framing it right now. Give life to the story and share it. How can we integrate moving forward? This is me. This is who I am. Here's the story. Here's how I experienced it. And then see integration. How you feel? I feel good. Yeah. In the process of solving some of your greatest problems, you're actually trying to address survival. And how do you show up? How do you try to make the best out of it? How do you acknowledge that sometimes the decisions that you make in that situation are you literally doing your best? In that moment, you are literally trying your best in a very complex, chaotic situation that literally has life or death implications. And this is happening all the time, every day, for years. How do you slow down? How do you take all that chaotic, fast moving energy and try to organize it? How do you give yourself a chance to see it, to listen to that energy, to feel that energy in a way that's less explosive, in a way that allows you to reflect upon it and learn from the patterns. That way, as you move forward, you can forecast at a higher level, forecast opportunities to be safe, to go beyond survival and to settle into a sense of thriving, all to have that sense of, sort of connection to a possibility, a connection to a, a beautiful future, all to have that threatened again. And then all the memories come back, potentially, the instincts, survival instincts. So the major takeaway is, how do we slow down and have a beautiful conversation with our survival instincts? So when we have that conversation, those survival instincts 
Now partner up with our intuition. Those survival instincts, now partner up with our intelligence, our ability to do research, our ability to network and socialize and share grand scheme ideas fueled by the survival instincts. Very powerful energy, very sharp, fast moving energy. The energy that helps you to build boundaries. The energy that helps you to live by your core values. The energy that wakes you up in the morning when you are tired. It's the resiliency. It's the master of the emotions. It's the tamer of your negative dialogue, survival instincts. Let's go, let's get it done, let's move. If it's guided by beautiful, intuitive, intellectual relationships, guided by these lenses, imagine the possibilities when you really know how to harness the power of your survival instincts. I'm Esco Wilson, and you've been listening to The Self-Awakened Lifestyle. You can find out more about me at theselfawakenedlifestyle.com. I'd like to thank Danica for coming to the show today. The Self-Awakened Lifestyle is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes shows like Soul Savvy Business and Just Between Coaches. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Melissa Deal assembled the episode. Danny Eaney is our executive producer. And post-production was by Post Office Sound. So you don't miss an upcoming episode. Please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening right now. If you like the show, please leave us a five-star review. It really does help us out. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.